Chapter 16 of The Witch of Prague, a Fantastic Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, a Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 16 the wanderer glanced at Unorna's face and saw the expression of relentless hatred which had settled upon her features. He neither understood it nor attempted to account for it. So far as he knew, Israel Kafka was mad, a man to be pitied, to be cared for, to be controlled perhaps, but assuredly not to be maltreated. Though the memories of the last half-hour were confused and distorted, the wanderer began to be aware that the young Hebrew had been made to suffer almost beyond the bounds of human endurance. So far as it was possible to judge, Israel Kafka's fault consisted in loving a woman who did not return his love, and his worst misdeed had been his sudden intrusion upon an interview in which the wanderer could recall nothing which might not have been repeated to the whole world with impunity. During the last month, he had lived a life of bodily and mentally indolence, in which all his keenest perceptions and strongest instincts had been lulled into a semi-dormant state. Unknown to himself, the mainspring of all thought and action had been taken out of his existence together with the very memory of it. For years he had lived and moved and wandered over the earth in obedience to one dominant idea. By a magic of which he knew nothing, that idea had been annihilated, temporarily, if not forever, and the immediate consequence had been the cessation of all interest and of all desire for individual action. The suspension of all anxiety, restlessness, and mental suffering had benefited the physical man, though it had reduced the intelligence to a state bordering upon total apathy. But organizations, mental or physical, of great natural strength, are never reduced to weakness by a period of inactivity. It is those minds and bodies which have been artificially developed by a long course of training to a degree of power they were never intended to possess, which lose that force almost immediately in idleness. The really very strong man has no need of constant gymnastic exercise. He will be stronger than other men whatever he does. The strong character needs not be constantly struggling against terrible odds in the most difficult situations in order to be sure of its own solidity, nor must the deep intellect be ever plodding through the mazes of intricate theories and problems that it may feel itself superior to minds of less compass. There is much natural inborn strength of body and mind in the world, and on the whole those who possess either accomplish more than those in whom either is the result of long and well-regulated training. The belief in a great cruelty and a greater injustice roused the man who throughout so many days had lived in calm indifference to every aspect of the humanity around him. Seeing that Israel Kafka could not be immediately restored to consciousness, he rose to his feet again and stood between the prostrate victim and Unorna. You are killing this man instead of saving him," he said. His crime, you say, is that he loves you. Is that a reason for using all your powers to destroy him in body and mind?" Perhaps, answered Unorna calmly, though there was still a dangerous light in her eyes. No, it is no reason, answered the wanderer with a decision to which Unorna was not accustomed. Keyork tells me that the man is mad. He may be. But he loves you and deserves mercy of you." "'Mercy!' exclaimed Unorna with a cruel laugh. "'You heard what he said. You were for silencing him yourself. You could not have done it. I have, and most effectually.' "'Whatever your art really may be, you use it badly and cruelly. A moment ago I was blinded myself. If I had understood clearly while you were speaking that you were making this poor fellow suffer in himself the hideous agony you described, I would have stopped you. You blinded me, as you dominated him. But I am not blind now. You shall not torment him any longer." "'And how would you have stopped me? How can you hinder me now? 
asked Unorna. The wanderer gazed at her in silence for some moments. There was an expression in his face which he had never seen there. Towering above her, he looked down. The massive brows were drawn together, the eyes were cold and impenetrable, every feature expressed strength. "'By force, if need be,' he answered very quietly. The woman before him was not of those who fear or yield. She met his glance boldly. Scarcely half an hour earlier she had been able to steal away his senses and make him subject to her. She was ready to renew the contest, though she realized that a change had taken place in him. "'You talk of force to a woman!' she exclaimed contemptuously. "'You are indeed brave!' "'You are not a woman. You are the incarnation of cruelty. I have seen it.' His eyes were cold and his voice was stern. Unorna felt a very sharp pain and shivered as though she were cold. Whatever else was bad and cruel and untrue in her wild nature, her love for him was true and passionate and enduring. And she loved him the more for the strength he was beginning to show, and for his determined opposition. The words he had spoken had hurt her as he little guessed they could not knowing that he alone of men had power to wound her. "'You do not know,' she answered. "'How should you?' Her glance fell and her voice trembled. "'I know enough,' he said. He turned coldly from her and knelt again beside Israel Kafka. He raised the pale head and supported it upon his knee, and gazed anxiously into the face, raising the lids with his finger as though to convince himself that the man was not dead. Indeed, there seemed to be but little life left in him as he lay there with outstretched arms and twisted fingers, scarcely breathing. In such a place, without so much as the commonest restorative to aid him, the wanderer saw that he had but little chance of success. Unorna stood aside, not looking at the two men. It was nothing to her whether Kafka lived or died. She was suffering herself, more than she had ever suffered in her life. He had said that she was not a woman, she whose whole woman's nature worshipped him. He had said that she was the incarnation of cruelty, and it was true, though it was her love for him that made her cruel to the other. Could he know what she had felt, when she had understood that Israel Kafka had heard her passionate words and seen her eager face and had laughed her to scorn? Could any woman at such a time be less than cruel? Was not her hate for the man who loved her as great as her love for the man who loved her not? Even if she possessed instruments of torture for the soul more terrible than those invented in darker ages to rack the human body, was she not justified in using them all? Was not Israel Kafka guilty of the greatest of all crimes, of loving when he was not loved, and of witnessing her shame and discomfiture? She could not bear to look at him, lest she should lose herself and try to thrust the wanderer aside and kill the man with her hands. Then she heard footsteps on the frozen path, and turning quickly she saw that the wanderer had lifted Kafka's body from the ground and was moving rapidly away, towards the entrance of the cemetery. He was leaving her in anger without a word. She turned very pale and hesitated. Then she ran forward to overtake him, but he, hearing her approach, quickened his stride, seeming but little hampered in his pace by the burden he bore. But Unorna, too, was fleet of foot and strong. "'Stop!' she cried, laying her hand upon his arm. "'Stop! Hear me! Do not leave me so!' But he would not pause, and hurried onward towards the gate while she hung upon his arm, trying to hinder him and speaking in desperate agitation. She felt that if she let him go now, he would leave her forever. In that moment even her hatred of Kafka sank into insignificance. She would do anything, bear anything, promise anything, rather than lose what she loved so wildly. "'Stop!' she cried again. "'I will save him. I will obey you. I will be kind to him. He will die in your arms if you do not let me help you. Oh, for the love of heaven, wait one moment, 
only one moment. She so thrust herself in the wanderer's path, hanging upon him and trying to tear Kafka from his arms, that he was forced to stand still and face her. Let me pass, he exclaimed, making another effort to advance. But she clung to him and he could not move. No, I will not let you go, she murmured. You can do nothing without me. You will only kill him, as I would have done a moment ago. And as you will do now, he said sternly, if I let you have your way. By all that is holy in heaven, I will save him. He shall not even remember. Do not swear. I shall not believe you. You will believe when you see. You will forgive me. You will understand." Without answering, he exerted his strength and clasping the insensible man more firmly in his arms, he made one or two steps forward. Unorna's foot slipped on the frozen ground and she would have fallen to the earth, but she clung to him with desperate energy. Seeing that she was in danger of some bodily hurt if he used greater force, the wanderer stopped again, uncertain how to act. Unorna stood before him, panting a little from the struggle, her face as white as death. "'Unless you kill me,' she said, "'you shall not take him away so. Hold him in your arms, if you will, but let me speak to him.' "'And how shall I know that you will not hurt him, you who hate him as you do?' "'Am I not at your mercy?' asked Unorna. "'If I deceive you, can you not do what you will with me, even if I try to resist you, which I will not? Hold me if you choose, lest I should escape you, and if Israel Kafka does not recover his strength and his consciousness, then take me with you and deliver me up to justice as a witch, as a murderess, if you will." The wanderer was silent for a moment. Then he realized that what she said was true. She was in his power. Restore him if you can, he said. Unorna laid her hands upon Kafka's forehead, and, bending down, whispered into his ear words which were inaudible even to the man who held him. The mysterious change from sleep to consciousness was almost instantaneous. He opened his eyes and looked first at Unorna and then at the wanderer. There was neither pain nor passion in his face, but only wonder. A moment more and his limbs regained their strength. He stood upright and passed his hand over his eyes as though trying to remember what had happened. "'How came I here?' he asked in surprise. "'What has happened to me?' "'You fainted,' said Unorna quietly. "'You remember that you were very tired after your journey. The walk was too much for you. We will take you home.' Yes, yes, I must have fainted. Forgive me, it comes over me sometimes." He evidently had complete control of his faculties at the present moment, when he glanced curiously from the one to the other of his two companions, as they all three began to walk towards the gate. Unorna avoided his eyes and seemed to be looking at the irregular slabs they passed on their way. The wanderer had intended to free himself from her as soon as Kafka regained his senses, but he had not been prepared for such a sudden change. He saw now that he could not exchange a word with her without exciting the man's suspicion, and he was by no means sure that the first emotion might not produce a sudden and dangerous effect. He did not even know how great the change might be, which Unorna's words had brought about that Kafka had forgotten at once his own conduct and the fearful vision which Unorna had imposed upon him was clear, but it did not follow that he had ceased to love her. Indeed, to one only partially acquainted with the laws which governed hypnotics, such a transition seemed very far removed from possibility. He, who in one moment had himself been made to forget utterly the dominant passion and love of his life, was so completely ignorant of the fact that he could not believe such a thing possible in any case whatsoever. In the dilemma in which he found himself there was nothing to be done but to be guided by circumstances. He was not willing to leave Kafka alone with the woman who hated him, and he saw no means of escaping her society so long as he chose to impose it upon them both. 
He supposed, too, that Unorna realized this as well as he did, and he tried to be prepared for all events by revolving all the possibilities in his mind. But Unorna was absorbed by very different thoughts. From time to time she stole a glance at his face, and she saw that it was stern and cold as ever. She had kept her word, but he did not relent. A terrible anxiety overwhelmed her. It was possible, even probable, that he would henceforth avoid her. She had gone too far. She had not reckoned upon such a nature as his, capable of being roused to implacable anger by mere sympathy for the suffering of another. Then, understanding it at last, she had thought it would be enough that those sufferings should be forgotten by him upon whom they had been inflicted. She could not comprehend the horror he had felt for herself and for her hideous cruelty. She had entered the cemetery in the consciousness of her strong will, and of her mysterious powers certain of victory, sure that having once sacrificed her pride and stooped so low as to command what should have come of itself, she should see his face change and hear the ring of passion in that passionless voice. She had failed in that, and utterly. She had been surprised by her worst enemy. She had been laughed to scorn in the moment of her deepest humiliation, and she had lost the foundations of friendship in the attempt to build upon them the hanging gardens of an artificial love. In that moment, as they reached the gate, Unorna was not far from despair. A Jewish boy, with puffed red lips and curving nostrils, was loitering at the entrance. The wanderer told him to find a carriage. Two carriages,' said Unorna quickly. The boy ran out. "'I will go home alone,' she added. "'You two can drive together.' The wanderer inclined his head in assent, but said nothing. Israel Kafka's dark eyes rested upon hers for a moment. "'Why not go together?' he asked. Unorna started slightly, and turned as though about to make a sharp answer. But she checked herself for the wanderer was looking at her. She spoke to him instead of answering Kafka. "'It is the best arrangement, do you not think so?' she asked. "'Quite the best.' "'I shall be gratified if you will bring me word of him,' she said, glancing at Kafka. The wanderer was silent, as though he had not heard. "'Have you been in pain? Do you feel as though you had been suffering?' she asked of the younger man, in a tone of sympathy and solicitude. "'No. Why do you ask?' Unorna smiled and looked at the wanderer with intention. He did not heed her. At that moment two carriages appeared and drew up at the end of the narrow alley which leads from the street to the entrance of the cemetery. All three walked forward together. Kafka went forward and opened the door of one of the conveyances for Unorna to get in. The wanderer, still anxious for the man's safety, would have taken his place, but Kafka turned upon him almost defiantly. "'Permit me,' he said. "'I was before you here.' The wanderer stood civilly aside and lifted his hat. Unorna held out her hand, and he took it coldly, not being able to do otherwise. "'You will let me know, will you not?' she said. "'I am anxious about him.' He raised his eyebrows a little and dropped her hand. "'You shall be informed,' he said. Kafka helped her to get into the carriage. She drew him by the hand so that his head was inside the door and the other man could not hear her words. "'I am anxious about you,' she said very kindly. "'Make him come himself to me and tell me how you are.' "'Surely, if you have asked him.' "'He hates me.' whispered Unorna quickly. "'Unless you make him come, he will send no message.' "'Then let me come myself. I am perfectly well.' "'Hush! No!' she answered hurriedly. "'Do as I say. It will be best for you, and for me. Good-bye.' "'Your word is my law,' said Kafka, drawing back. His eyes were bright, and his thin cheek was flushed. It was long since she had spoken so kindly to him. A ray of hope entered his life. The wanderer saw the look and interpreted it rightly. He understood that in that brief moment Unorna had found time to do some mischief. 
Her carriage drove on and left the two men free to enter the one intended for them. Kafka gave the driver the address of his lodgings. Then he sank back into the corner, exhausted and conscious of his extreme weakness. A short silence followed. "'You are in need of rest,' said the wanderer, watching him curiously. "'Indeed, I am very tired, if not actually ill. You have suffered enough to tire the strongest.' "'In what way?' asked Kafka. "'I have forgotten what happened. I know that I followed Unorna to the cemetery. I had been to her house, and I saw you afterwards together. I had not spoken to her since I came back from my long journey this morning. Tell me what occurred. Did she make me sleep? I feel as if I have felt before when I have fancied that she has hypnotized me." The wanderer looked at him in surprise. The question was asked as naturally as though it referred to an everyday occurrence of little or no weight. Yes, he answered. She made you sleep. Why, do you know? If she has made me dream something, I have forgotten it. The wanderer hesitated a moment. I cannot answer your question, he said at length. Ah, she told me that you hated her, said Kafka, turning his dark eyes to his companion. But yet, he added, that is hardly a reason why you should not tell me what happened. I could not tell you the truth without saying something which I have no right to say to a stranger, which I could not easily say to a friend. You need not spare me. It might save you. Then say it, though I do not know from what danger I am to be saved. But I can guess, perhaps, you would advise me to give up the attempt to win her. Precisely. I need say no more." "'On the contrary,' said Kafka, with sudden energy. "'When a man gives such advice as that to a stranger, he is bound to give also his reasons.' The wanderer looked at him calmly as he answered, "'One man need hardly give a reason for saving another man's life. Yours is in danger.' "'I see that you hate her, as she said you did.' You and she are both mistaken in that. I am not in love with her, and I have ceased to be her friend. As for my interest in you, it does not even pretend to be friendly. It is that which any man may feel for a fellow being, and what any man would feel who had seen what I have seen this afternoon." The calm bearing and speech of the experienced man of the world carried weight with it in the eyes of the young Moravian, whose hot blood knew little of restraint and less of caution. With the keen instinct of his race in the reading of character, he suddenly understood that his companion was at once generous and disinterested. A burst of confidence followed close upon the conviction. "'If I am to lose her love, I would rather lose my life also, and by her hand,' he said hotly. "'You are warning me against her. I feel that you are honest, and I see that you are in earnest. I thank you. If I am in danger, do not try to save me. I saw her face a few moments ago, and she spoke to me. I cannot believe that she is plotting my destruction." The wanderer was silent. He wondered whether it was his duty to do or say more. Unorna was a changeable woman. She might love the man tomorrow. But Israel Kafka was too young to let the conversation drop. Boylike, he expected confidence for confidence and was surprised at his companion's taciturnity. "'What did she say to me when I was asleep?' he asked after a short pause. "'Did you ever hear the story of Simon Abelis?' the wanderer inquired by way of answer. Kafka frowned and looked round sharply. "'Simon Abelis? He was a renegade Hebrew boy. His father killed him. He is buried in the Teinkirsch. What of him? What has he to do with Unorna or with me? I am myself a Jew. The time has gone by when we Jews hid our heads. I am proud of what I am, and I will never be a Christian. What can Simon Abelis have to do with me?" Little enough, now that you are awake. And when I was asleep, what then? She made me see him, perhaps? 
She made you live his life. She made you suffer all that he suffered." "'What?' cried Israel Kafka in a loud and angry tone. "'What I say,' returned the other quietly. "'And you did not interfere? You did not stop her? No, of course, I forgot that you are a Christian.' The wanderer looked at him in surprise. It had not struck him that Israel Kafka might be a man of the deepest religious convictions, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and that what he would resent most would be the fact that in his sleep Unorna had made him play the part and suffer the martyrdom of a convert to Christianity. This was exactly what took place. He would have suffered anything at Unorna's hands and without complaint, even to bodily death. But his wrath rose furiously at the thought that she had been playing with what he held most sacred, that she had forced from his lips the denial of the faith of his people and the confession of the Christian belief, perhaps the very words of the hated creed. The modern Hebrew of Western Europe might be indifferent in such a case as though he had spoken in the delirium of a fever, but the Jew of the less civilized East is a different being, and in some ways a stronger. Israel Kafka represented the best type of his race, and his blood boiled at the insult that had been put upon him. The wanderer saw and understood and at once began to respect him, as men who believe firmly in opposite creeds have been known to respect each other even in a life-and-death struggle. "'I would have stopped her if I could,' he said. "'Were you sleeping too?' asked Kafka hotly. I cannot tell. I was powerless, though I was conscious. I saw only Simon Abelis in it all, though I seemed to be aware that you and he were one person. I did interfere, as soon as I was free to move. I think I saved your life. I was carrying you away in my arms when she waked you. I thank you. I suppose it is as you tell me. You could not move. But you saw it all, you say. You saw me play the part of the apostate. You heard me confess the Christian's faith?" Yes, I saw you die in agony, confessing it still. Israel Kafka ground his teeth and turned his face away. The wanderer was silent. A few moments later the carriage stopped at the door of Kafka's lodging. The latter turned to his companion, who was startled by the change in the young face. The mouth was now closely set, the features seemed bolder, the eyes harder and more manly. A look of greater dignity and strength was in the whole. "'You do not love her?' he asked. "'Do you give me your word that you do not love her?' "'If you need so much to assure you of it, I give you my word. I do not love her.' "'Will you come with me for a few moments? I live here.' The wanderer made a gesture of assent. In a few moments they found themselves in a large room furnished almost in eastern fashion, with few objects but those of great value. Israel Kafka was alone in the world, and was rich. There were two or three divans, a few low, octagonal, inlaid tables, a dozen or more splendid weapons hung upon the wall, and the polished wooden floor was partly covered with extremely rich carpets. Do you know what she said to me when I helped her into the carriage?" asked Kafka. No, I did not attempt to hear. She did not mean that you should hear her. She made me promise to send you to her with news of myself. She said that you hated her and would not go to her unless I begged you to do so. Is that true? I have told you that I do not hate her. I hate her cruelty. I will certainly not go to her of my own choice. She said that I had fainted. That was a lie. She invented it as an excuse to attract you, on the ground of her interest in my condition. Evidently. She hates me with an extreme hatred. Her real interest lay in showing you how terrible that hatred could be. It is not possible to conceive of anything more diabolically bad than what she did to me. She made me her sport, yours too, perhaps, or she would at least have wished it. On that holy ground where my people lie in peace, 
she made me deny my faith. She made me, in your eyes and her own, personate a renegade of my race. She made me confess in the Christian creed. She made me seem to die for a belief I abhor. Can you conceive of anything more devilish? A moment later she smiles upon me and presses my hand, and is anxious to know of my good health. And, but for you, I should never have known what she had done to me. I owe you gratitude, though it be for the worst pain I have ever suffered. But do you think I will forgive her?" "'You would be very forgiving if you could,' said the wanderer, his own anger rising again at the remembrance of what he had seen. "'And do you think that I can love still?' "'No. Israel Kafka walked the length of the room and then came back and stood before the wanderer and looked into his eyes. His face was very calm and resolute, the flush had vanished from his thin cheeks, and the features were set in an expression of irrevocable determination. Then he spoke, slowly and distinctly. "'You are mistaken. I love her with all my heart. I will therefore kill her.' The wanderer had seen many men in many lands, and had witnessed the effects of many passions. He gazed earnestly into Israel Kafka's face, searching in vain for some manifestation of madness. But he was disappointed. The Moravian had formed his resolution in cold blood, and intended to carry it out. His only folly appeared to lie in the announcement of his intention. But his next words explained even that. She made me promise to send you to her if you would go, he said. Will you go to her now? What shall I tell her? I warn you that, since you need not warn me, I know what you would say. But I will be no common murderer. I will not kill her as she would have killed me. Warn her, not me. Go to her and say, Israel Kafka has promised before God that he will take your blood in expiation, and there is no escape from the man who is himself ready to die. Tell her to fly for her life, and that quickly. And what will you gain by doing this murder? asked the wanderer calmly. He was revolving schemes for Unorna's safety, and half amazed to find himself forced in common humanity to take her part. I shall free myself of my shame in loving her, at the price of her blood and mine. Will you go? And what is to prevent me from delivering you over to safe keeping before you do this deed?" "'You have no witness,' answered Kafka with a smile. "'You are a stranger in the city and in this country, and I am rich. I shall easily prove that you love Unorna, and that you wish to get rid of me out of jealousy. That is true," said the wanderer thoughtfully. I will go. Go quickly, then, said Israel Kafka, for I shall follow soon. As the wanderer left the room, he saw the Moravian turn toward the place where the keen, splendid eastern weapons hung upon the wall. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of the Witch of Prague A Fantastic Tale This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Witch of Prague A Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford, Chapter Seventeen. The wanderer knew that the case was urgent and the danger great. There was no mistaking the tone of Israel Kafka's voice, nor the look in his face, nor did the savage resolution seem altogether unnatural in a man of the Moravian breeding. 
the wanderer had no time and but little inclination to blame himself for the part he had played in disclosing to the principal actor the nature of the scene which had taken place in the cemetery and the immediate consequences of that disclosure though wholly unexpected did not seem utterly illogical israel kafka's nature was eastern violently passionate and at the same time long-suffering in certain directions as only the fatalist can be he could have loved for a lifetime faithfully without requital he would have suffered in patience unorna's anger scorn pity or caprice he had long before now resigned his free will into the keeping of a passion which was degrading as it enslaved all his thoughts and actions but which had something noble in it inasmuch as it fitted him for the most heroic self-sacrifice unorna's act had brought the several seemingly contradictory elements of his character to bear upon one point he had realized in the same moment that it was impossible for her to love him that her changing treatment of him was not the result of caprice but of a fixed plan of her own in the execution of which she would spare him neither falsehood nor insult that to love such a woman was the lowest degradation that he could nevertheless not destroy that love and finally that the only escape from his shame lay in her destruction and that this must in all probability involve his own death also at the same time he felt that there was something solemn in the expiation he was about to exact something that accorded well with the fierce traditions of ancient israel and the deed should not be done stealthily or in the dark unorna must know that she was to die by his hand and why he had no object in concealment for his own life was already ended by the certainty that his love was hopeless and on the other hand fatalist as he was he believed that unorna could not escape him and that no warning could save her the wanderer understood most of these things as he hastened towards her house through the darkening streets not a carriage was to be seen and he was obliged to traverse the distance on foot as often happens at supreme moments when everything might be gained by the saving of a few minutes in conveying a warning he saw himself in a very strange position half an hour had not elapsed since he had watched unorna driving away from the cemetery and had inwardly determined that he would never if possible set eyes on her again scarcely two hours earlier he had been speaking to her of the sincere friendship which he felt was growing up for her in his heart since then he had learned almost beyond the possibility of a doubt that she loved him and he learned too to despise her he had left her meaning that the parting should be final and now he was hurrying to her house to give her the warning which alone could save her from destruction and yet he found it impossible to detect any inconsistency in his own conduct as he had been conscious of doing his utmost to save israel kafka from her so now he knew that he was doing all he could to save urena from the moravian and he recognized the fact that no man with the commonest feelings of humanity could have done less in either case but he was conscious also of a change in himself which he did not attempt to analyze his indolent self-satisfied apathy was gone the strong interest of human life and death stirred him mind and body together acquired their activity and he was at all points once more a man he was ignorant indeed of what had been taken from him the memory of beatrice was gone and he fancied himself one who had never loved woman he looked back with horror and amazement upon the emptiness of his past life 
wondering how such an existence as he had led or fancied he had led could have been possible but there was scant time for reflection upon the problem of his own mission in the world as he hastened toward unorna's house his present mission was clear enough and simple enough though by no means easy of accomplishment what israel kafka had told him was very true should he attempt a denunciation he would have little chance of being believed it would be easy enough for kafka to bring witnesses to prove his own love for unorna and the wanderer's intimacy with her during the past month and the latter's consequent interest in disposing summarily of his moravian rival a stranger in the land would have small hope of success against a man whose antecedents were known whose fortunes were reputed great and who had at his back the whole gigantic strength of the jewish interest in prague if he chose to invoke the assistance of his people the matter would end in a few days in the wanderer being driven from the country while israel kafka would be left behind to work his will as might seem best in his own eyes there was keyork arabian so far as it was possible to believe in the sincerity of any of the strange persons among whom the wanderer found himself it seemed certain that the sage was attached to unorna by some bond of mutual interest which he would be loath to break keyork had many acquaintances and seemed to possess everywhere a certain amount of respect whether because he was perhaps a member of some widespread mysterious society of which the wanderer knew nothing or whether this importance of his was due to his personal superiority of mind and wide experience of travel no one could say but it seems certain that if unorna could be placed for a time being in a safe refuge it would be best to apply to keyork to ensure her further protection meanwhile the refuge must be found and unorna must be conveyed to it without delay the wanderer was admitted without question he found unorna in her accustomed place she had thrown aside her furs and was sitting in an attitude of deep thought her dress was black and in the soft light of the shaded lamps she was like a dark marble statue set in the midst of thick shrubbery in a garden her elbows rested on her knee her chin upon her beautiful heavy hand only in her hair there was a bright colour she knew the wanderer's footsteps but she neither moved her body nor turned her head she felt that she grew paler than before and she could hear her heart beating strongly i come from israel kafka said the wanderer standing still before her she knew from his tone how hard his face must be and she would not look up what of him she asked in a voice without expression is he well he bids me say to you that he has promised before heaven to take your life and that there is no escape from a man who is ready to lay down his own unorna turned her head slowly towards him and a very soft look stole over her strange face and you have brought me his message this warning to save me she said as i tried to save him from you an hour ago but there is little time the man is desperate whether mad or sane i cannot tell make haste determine where to go for safety and i will take you there but unorna did not move she only looked at him with an expression he could no longer misunderstand he was cold and impassive i fancy it will not be safe to hesitate long he said he is in earnest i do not fear israel kafka and i fear death less answered unorna deliberately why does he mean to kill me i think that in his place most every human man would feel as he does though religion or prudence or fear or all three together might prevent them from doing what they would wish to do 
you too and which of the three would prevent you from murdering me none perhaps though pity might i want no pity least of all from you what i have done i have done for you and for you only the wanderer's face showed only a cold disgust he said nothing you do not seem surprised said unorna you know that i love you i know it a silence followed during which unorna returned to her former attitude turning her eyes away and resting her chin upon her hand the wanderer began to grow impatient i must repeat that in my opinion you have not much time to spare he said if you are not in a place of safety in half an hour i cannot answer for the consequences no time there is all eternity what is eternity or time or life to me i will wait for him here why did you tell him what i did if you wish me to live why since there are to be questions why did you exercise your cruelty upon an innocent man who loves you why there are reasons enough unorna's voice trembled slightly you do not know what happened how should you you were asleep you may as well know since i may be beyond telling you an hour from now you may as well know how i love you and to what depths i have gone down to win your love i would rather not receive your confidence the wanderer answered haughtily i came here to save your life not to hear your confessions and when you have heard you will no longer wish to save me if you choose to leave me here i will wait for israel kafka alone he may kill me if he pleases i do not care but if you stay you shall hear what i have to say she glanced at his face he folded his arms and stood still whatever she had done he would not leave her alone at the mercy of the desperate man whom he expected every moment to enter the room if she would not save herself he might nevertheless disarm kafka and prevent the deed as his long sleeping energy revived in him the thought of a struggle was not disagreeable i loved you from the moment when i first saw you said unorna trying to speak calmly but you loved another woman do you remember her her name was beatrice and she was very dark as i am fair you had lost her and you had sought her for years you entered my house thinking that she had gone in before you do you remember that morning it was a month ago to-day you told me the story you have dreamed it said the wanderer in cold surprise i never loved any woman yet unorna laughed bitterly how perfect it all was at first she exclaimed how smooth it seemed how easy you slept before me out there by the river that very afternoon and in your sleep i bade you forget and you forgot wholly your love the woman her very name even as israel kafka forgot to-day what he had suffered in the person of the martyr you told him the story and he believes you because he knows me and knows what i can do you can believe me or not as you will i did it you are dreaming the wanderer repeated wondering whether she was not out of her mind i did it i said to myself that if i could destroy your old love root it out from your heart and from your memory and make you as one who had never loved at all then you would love me as you had once loved her with your whole free soul i said i was beautiful is it true is it not and young i am and i loved as no other woman ever loved and i said that it was enough and that soon you would love me too a month has passed away since then you are of ice of stone i do not know of what you are this morning you hurt me i thought it was the last hurt and that i should die then instead of to-night do you remember you thought i was ill and you went away when you were gone i fought with myself my dreams yes i had dreamed of all that can make earth heaven and you had waked me 
you said that you would be a brother to me you talked of friendship the sting of it it is no wonder that i grew faint with pain had you struck me in the face i would have kissed your hand but your friendship rather be dead than loving beheld a friend and i had dreamed of being dear to you for my own sake of being dearest and first and alone beloved since the other was gone and i had burned her memory the pride i had still until that moment i fancied that it was in my power if i would stoop so low to make you sleep again as you had slept before and to make you at my bidding feel all i felt i fought with myself i would not go down to that depth and then i said that even that were better than your friendship even a false semblance of love inspired by my will preserved by my suggestion and so i fell you came back to me and i led you to that lonely place and made you sleep and then i told you what was in my heart and poured out my fire of my soul into your ears a look came into your face i shall not forget it my folly was upon me and i thought it was for me i know the truth now sleeping the old memory revived in you of her whom waking you will never remember again but the look was there and i bade you awake my soul rose in my eyes i hung upon your lips the loving word i longed for seemed already to tremble in the air then came the truth you awoke and your face was stone calm smiling indifferent unloving and all this israel kafka had seen hiding like a thief almost beside us he saw it all he heard it all my words of love my agony of waiting my utter humiliation my burning shame was i cruel to him he had made me suffer and he suffered in his turn all this you did not know you know it now there is nothing more to tell will you wait here until he comes will you look on and be glad to see me die will you remember in the years to come with satisfaction that you saw the witch killed for her many misdeeds and for the chief of them all for loving you the wanderer had listened to her words but the tale they told was beyond the power of his belief he stood still in his place with folded arms debating what he should do to save her one thing alone was clear she loved him to distraction possibly he thought her story was but an invention to excuse her cruelty and to win his commiseration it failed to do either at first but yet he would not leave her to her fate you shall not die if i can help it he said simply and if you save me do you think that i will leave you she asked with sudden agitation turning and half rising from her seat think what you will be doing if you save me think well you say that israel kafka is desperate i am worse than desperate worse than mad with my love she sank back again and hid her face for a moment he on his part began to see the terrible reality and strength of her passion and silently wondered what the end would be he too was human and pity for her began at last to touch his heart you shall not die if i can save you he said again she sprang to her feet very suddenly and stood before him you pity me she cried what lie is that which says that there is a kinship between pity and love think well beware be warned i have told you much but you do not know me yet if you save me you save me but to love you more than i do already look at me for there is neither god nor hell nor pride nor shame there is nothing that i will not do nothing i shall be ashamed or afraid of doing if you save me you save me that i may follow you as long as i live i will never leave you 
you shall never escape my presence your whole life shall be full of me you do not love me and i can threaten you with nothing more intolerable than myself your eyes will weary of the sight of me and your ears at the sound of my voice do you think i have no hope a moment ago i had none but i see it now whether you will or not i shall be yours you may make a prisoner of me i shall be in your keeping then and shall know it and feel it and love my prison for your sake even if you will not let me see you if you would escape from me you must kill me as israel kafka means to kill me now and then i shall die by your hand and my life will have been yours and given to you how can you think that i have no hope i have hope and certainly for i shall be near you always to the end always 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 i will cling to you as i do now and say i love you i love you yes and you will cast me off but i will not go i will clasp your feet and say again i love you and you may spurn me man god wanderer devil whatever you are beloved always tread upon me trample on me crush me you cannot save yourself you cannot kill my love she had tried to take his hand and he had withdrawn his she had fallen upon her knees and as he tried to free himself had fallen almost to her length upon the marble floor clinging to his very feet so that he could make no step without doing her some hurt he looked down amazed and silent and as he looked she cast one glance upward to his stern face the bright tears streaming like falling gems from her unlike eyes her face pale and quivering her rich hair all loosened and falling about her and then neither body nor heart nor soul could bear the enormous strain that was laid upon them a low cry broke from her lips a stormy sob another and another like quick short waves breaking over the bar when the tide is low and the wind is rising suddenly the wanderer was in sore straits for the minutes were passing quickly and he remembered the last look on kafka's face and how he had felt the moravian standing before the weapons on the wall and nothing had been done yet not so much as an order given not to admit him if he came to the house at any moment he might be upon them and the storm showed no signs of being spent her wild convulsive sobbing was painful to hear if he tried to move she dragged herself frantically at his feet so that he feared lest he should tread upon her hands he pitied her now most truly though he guessed rightly that to show his pity would be but to add fuel to the blazing flame then in an interval of a second as she drew breath to weep afresh he fancied that he heard sounds below as of a great door being opened and closed again with a quick strong movement stooping low he put his arms about her and raised her from the floor at his touch her sobbing ceased for a moment as though she had wanted only that to soothe her in spite of him she let her head rest upon his shoulder letting him still feel that if he did not support her weight with his arm she would fall again in the midst of the most passionate and real outbursts of despairing love there was no artifice which she would not use to be nearer to him to extort even the semblance of a caress i heard someone come in below he said hurriedly it must be he decide quickly what to do either stay or fly you have not ten seconds for your choice she turned her imploring eyes to his let me stay here and end it all that you shall not he exclaimed dragging her towards the end of the hall opposite to the usual entrance and where he knew that there must be a door behind the screen of plants his hold tightened upon her yielding waist 
her head fell back and her full lips parted in an ecstasy of delight as she felt herself hurried along in his arms scarcely touching the floor with her feet ah now now let it come now she sighed it must be now or never he said almost roughly if you will leave this house with me now very well but leave this room you shall if i am to meet that man and stop him i will meet him alone leave you alone ah no not that they had reached the exit now at the same instant both heard someone enter at the other end and rapid footsteps on the marble pavement which is it to be asked the wanderer pale and calm he had pushed her through before him and seemed ready to go back alone with violent strength she drew him to her closed the door and slipped the strong steel bolt across below the lock there was a dim light in the passage together then she said i shall at least be with you a little while longer is there another way out of the house asked the wanderer anxiously more than one come with me as they disappeared in the corridor they heard behind them the noise of a door lock as someone tried to force it open then a heavy sound as though a man's shoulder struck against the solid panel unorna led the way through the narrow winding passage illuminated here and there by small lamps with shades of soft colours blown in bohemian glass pushing aside a curtain they came out into a small room the wanderer uttered an involuntary exclamation of surprise as he recognized the vestibule and saw before him the door of the great conservatory open as israel kafka had left it that the latter was still trying to pursue them through the opposite excess was clear enough for the blows he was striking on the panel echoed loudly into the hall swiftly and silently unorna closed the entrance and locked it securely he is safe for a little while she said keyork will find him there when he comes an hour hence and keyork will perhaps bring him to his senses she had regained control of herself to all appearances and she spoke with perfect calm and self-possession the wanderer looked at her in surprise and with some suspicion her hair was all falling about her shoulders but saving this sign there was no trace of the recent storm nor the least indication of passion if she had been acting a part throughout before an audience she would have seemed less indifferent when the curtain fell the wanderer having little cause to trust her found it hard to believe that she had not been counterfeiting it seemed impossible that she should be the same woman who but a moment earlier had been dragging herself at his feet in wild tears and wilder protestations of her love if you are sufficiently rested he said with a touch of sarcasm which he could not restrain i would suggest that we do not wait any longer here she turned and faced him and he saw now how very white she was so you think that even now i have been deceiving you that is what you think i see it in your face before he could prevent her she had opened the door wide again and was advancing calmly into the conservatory israel kafka she cried in loud clear tones i am here i am waiting come the wanderer ran forward he caught sight in the distance of a pair of fiery eyes and of something long and thin and sharp gleaming under the soft lamps he knew then that all was deadly earnest swift as thought he caught unorna and bore her from the hall locking the door again and setting his broad shoulders against it as he put her down the daring act she had done appealed to him in spite of himself i beg your pardon he said almost deferentially i misjudged you is it that she answered either i will be with you or i will die 
by his hand by yours by my own it will matter little when it's done you need not lean against the door it is very strong your furs are hanging there and here are mine let us be going quietly as though nothing unusual had happened they descended the stairs together the porter came forward with all due ceremony to open the shut door unorna told him that if keyork arabian came while he she was out he was to be shown directly into the conservatory a moment later she and her companion were standing together in the small irregular square before the clementium where will you go asked the wanderer with you she answered laying her hand upon his arm and looking into his face as though waiting to see what direction he would choose unless you send me back to him she added glancing quickly at the house and making as though she would withdraw her hand once more if it is to be that i will go alone there seemed to be no way out of the terrible dilemma and the wanderer stood still in deep thought he knew that if he could but free himself from her for half an hour he could get help from the right quarter and take israel kafka red-handed and armed as he was for the man was caught as in a trap and must stay there until he was released and there would be little doubt from his manner when taken that he was either mad or consciously attempting some crime there was no longer any necessity he thought for unorna to take refuge anywhere for more than an hour in that time israel kafka would be in safe custody and she could re-enter her house with nothing to fear but he counted without unorna's unyielding obstinacy she threatened if he left her for a moment to go back to israel kafka a few minutes earlier she had carried out her threat and the consequences had been almost fatal if you are in your right mind he said at last beginning to walk towards the corner you will see that what you wish to do is utterly against reason i will not allow you to run the risk of meeting israel kafka to-night but i cannot take you with me no i will hold you if you try to escape me and i will bring you to a place of safety by force if need be and you will leave me there and i shall never see you again i will not go and you will find it hard to take me anywhere in the crowded city by force you are not israel kafka with the whole jews quarter at your command in which to hide me the wanderer was perplexed he saw however that if he would yield the point and give his word to return to her she might be induced to follow his advice if i promise to come back to you will you do what i ask he inquired will you promise truly i have never broken a promise yet did you promise that other woman that you would never love again i wonder if so you are faithful indeed but you have forgotten that will you come back to me if i let you take me where i shall be safe to-night i will come back whenever you send for me if you fail my blood is on your head yes on my head be it very well i will go to that house where i first stayed when i came here take me there quickly no not quickly either let it be very long i shall not see you until to-morrow a carriage was passing at a foot's pace the wanderer stopped it and helped unorna to get in the place was very near and neither spoke though he could feel her hand upon his arm he made no attempt to shake her off at the gate they both got out and he rang a bell that echoed through the vaulted passages far away in the interior to-morrow said unorna touching his hand he could see even in the dark the look of love she turned upon him good night he said and in the next moment she had disappeared within end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the witch of prague a fantastic tale 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 18. Having made the necessary explanations to account for her sudden appearance, Unorna found herself installed in two rooms of modest dimensions and very simply though comfortably furnished it was quite a common thing for ladies to seek a retreat and quiet in the convent during two or three weeks of the year and there was plenty of available space at the disposal of those who wished to do so such visits were indeed most commonly made during the lenten season and on the day when unorna sought refuge among the nuns it chanced that there was but one other stranger within the walls she was glad to find that this was the case her peculiar position would have made it hard for her to bear with equanimity the quiet observation of a number of women most of whom would probably have been to some extent acquainted with the story of her life and some of whom would certainly have wished out of curiosity to enter into nearer acquaintance with her while within the convent while not intending to prolong their intercourse with her any further it could not be expected indeed that in a city like prague such a woman as unorna could escape notice and the fact that little or nothing was known of her true history had left a very wide field for the imagination of those who chose to invent one for her the common story and the one which on the whole was the nearest to the truth told that she was the daughter of a noble of eastern bohemia who had died soon after her birth the last of his family having converted his ancestral possessions into money for unorna's benefit in order to destroy all trace of her relationship to him the secret must of course have been confined to some one but it had been kept faithfully and unorna herself was no wiser than those who mused themselves with fruitless speculations regarding her origin if from the first from the moment when as a young girl she left the convent to enter into possession of her fortune she had chosen to assert some right to a footing in the most exclusive aristocracy in the world it is not impossible that the protection of the abbess might have helped her to obtain it the secret of her birth would however have rendered a marriage with a man of that class all but impossible and would have entirely excluded her from the only other position considered dignified for a well-born woman of fortune unmarried and wholly without living relations or connections that of a lady canoness on the crown foundation moreover her wild bringing up and the singular natural gifts she possessed and which she could not resist the impulse to exercise had in a few months placed her in a position from which no escape was possible so long as she continued to live in prague and against those few chiefly men who for her beauty's sake or out of curiosity would gladly have made her acquaintance she raised an impassable barrier of pride and reserve nor was her reputation altogether an evil one she lived in a strange fashion it is true but the very fact of her extreme seclusion had kept her name free from stain if people spoke of her as the witch it was more from habit and half in jest than in earnest in strong contradiction to the cruelty which she could exercise ruthlessly when roused to anger was her well-known kindness to the poor and her charities to institutions founded for their benefit were in reality considerable and were said to be boundless 
these explanations seemed necessary in order to account for the readiness with which she turned to the convent when she was in danger and for the facilities which were then what at once offered her for a stay long or short as she could please to make it some of the more suspicious nuns looked grave when they heard that she was under their roof others again had been attracted to her during the time she had formerly spent with them and there was not lacking those who disapproving of her presence held her peace in the anticipation that the rich and eccentric lady would on departing present a gift of value to their order the rooms which were kept at the disposal of ladies desiring to make a religious retreat for a short time were situated on the first floor of one wing of the convent overlooking a garden which was not within the cloistered precincts but which were cultivated for the convenience of the nuns who themselves never entered it the windows on this side were not latticed and the ladies who occupied the apartments were at liberty to look out upon the small square of land for their view of the street beyond being cut off however by a wall in which there was one iron gate for the convenience of the gardeners who were thus not obliged to pass through the main entrance of the convent in order to reach their work within the rooms all opened out upon a broad vaulted corridor lighted in the daytime by a huge arch window looking upon an inner court and at night by a single lamp suspended in the middle of the passage by a strong iron chain the pavement of this passage was of broad stones once smooth and even but now worn and made irregular by long use the rooms for the guests were carpeted with sombre colours and warmed by high stoves built up of glazed white tiles the furniture as it has been said was simple but afforded all that was strictly necessary for ordinary comfort each apartment consisting of a bedroom and a sitting-room small in lateral dimensions but relatively very high the walls were thick and not easily penetrated by any sounds from without and as in many religious houses the entrance from the quarter were all closed by double doors the outer one of strong oak with a lock and solid bolt the inner one of lighter material but thickly padded to exclude sound as well as currents of cold air each sitting-room contained a table a sofa three or four chairs a small bookshelf and a praying stool provided with a hard and well-worn cushion for the knees over this a brown wooden crucifix was hung upon the gray wall in the majority of convents it is not usual nor even permissible for ladies in retreat to descend to the nun's refectory when there are many guests they are usually served by lay sisters in a hall set apart for the purpose when there are few their simple meals are brought to them in their rooms moreover they are of course put on no religious robe though they dress themselves in black in the church or chapel as the case may be they do not take places within the lattice choir with the sisters but either sit in the body of the building or occupy a side chapel reserved for their use or else perform their devotions kneeling at high windows above the choir which communicate within with rooms accessible from the convent it is usual for them to attend mass vespers the benediction and complines but when there are midnight services they are not expected to be present unorna was familiar with convent life and was aware that the benediction was over and that the hour for the evening meal was approaching a fire had been lighted in her sitting-room but the air was still very cold and she sat wrapped in her furs as when she had arrived 
leaning back in a corner of the sofa her head inclined forward and one white hand resting on the green baize cloth which covered the table she was very tired and the absolute stillness was refreshing and restoring after the long drawn-out emotions of the stormy day never in her short and passionate life had so many events been crowded into the space of a few hours since the morning she had felt almost everything that her wild high-strung nature was capable of feeling love triumph failure humiliation anger hate despair and the danger of sudden death she was amazed when looking back she remembered that at noon on that day her life and all its interests had been stationary at the point familiar to her during a whole month the point that still lay within the boundaries of hope's kingdom the point at which the man she loved had wounded her by speaking of brotherly affection and sisterly regard she could almost believe when she thought of it all that someone had done to her as she had done to others that she had been cast into a state of sleep and had been forced against her will to live through the storms of years in the lethargy of an hour and yet despite all her memory was distinct her faculties were awake her intellect had lost none of its clearness even in the last and worst hour of all she could recall each look on the wanderer's face each tone of his cold speech each intonation of her own passionate outpourings her strong memory had retained all and there was not the slightest break in the continuity of her recollections but there was little comfort to be derived from the certainty that she had not been dreaming and that everything had really taken place precisely as she remembered it she would have given all she possessed which was much to return to the hour of noon on that same day in so far as a very unruly nature can understand itself unorna understood the springs of the action she regretted and confessed that in all likelihood she would do again as she had done at each successive stage indeed since the last great outbreak of her heart she realized more than ever the great proportions which her love had of late assumed and she saw that she was indeed ready as she had said to dare everything and risk everything for the sake of obtaining the very least show of passion in return it was quite clear to her since she had failed so totally that she should have had patience that she ought to have accepted gratefully the man's offer of brotherly devotion and trusted in time to bring about a further and less platonic development but she was equally sure that she could never have found the patience and that if she had restrained herself to-day she would have given way to-morrow she possessed all the blind indifference to consequences which is a chief characteristic of the slav nature when dominated by passion she had shown it in her rash readiness to face israel kafka at the moment of leaving her own home if she could not have had what she longed for she cared as little what became of her as she cared for kafka's own fate she had but one object one passion one desire and to all else her indifference was supreme life and death in this world or the next were less weighty than feathers in a scale that measured hundreds of tons the very idea of balance for the moment beyond her imagination for a while indeed the pride of a woman at once young beautiful and accustomed to authority had kept her firm in the determination to be loved for herself as she believed that she deserved to be loved and just so long as that remained she had held her head high confidently expecting that the mask of indifference would soon be shivered that the eyes she adored would soften with warm light that the hand she worshipped would tremble suddenly as though wakening to life within her own but that pride was gone 
and from its disappearance there had been but one step to most utter degradation of soul to which a woman can descend and from that again but one step more to a resolution almost stupid in its hardened obstinacy but as though to show how completely she was dominated by the man whom she could not win even her last determination had yielded under the slightest pressure from his will she had left her house beside him with the mad resolve never again to be parted from him cost what it might reputation fortune life itself and yet ten minutes had not elapsed before she found herself alone trusting to a mere word of his for the hope of ever seeing him again she seemed to have no individuality left he had spoken and she had obeyed he had commanded and she had done his bidding she was even more ashamed of this than of having wept and sobbed and dragged herself at his feet in the first moment she had submitted deluding herself with the idea she had expressed that he was consigning her to a prison and that her freedom was dependent on his will the foolish delusion vanished she saw that she was free when she chose to descend the steps she had just mounted to go out through the gate she had lately entered and to go whithersoever she would at the mere risk of meeting israel kafka and that risk she heartily despised being thoroughly brave by nature and utterly indifferent to death by force of circumstance she comforted herself with the thought that the wanderer would come to her once at least when she was pleased to send for him she had that loyal belief inseparable from true love until violently overthrown by irrefutable evidence and which sometimes has such power as to return even then overthrowing the evidence of the senses themselves are there not men who trust women and women who trust men in spite of the vilest betrayals love is indeed often the inspirer of subjective visions creating in the beloved objects the qualities it admires and virtues it adores powerless to accept what is not willing to see dwelling in a fortress guided by intangible and therefore indestructible fiction and proof against the artillery of facts unorna's confidence was however not misplaced the man whose promise she had received had told the truth when he had said that she had never broken any promise whatsoever in this at least there was therefore comfort on the morrow she would see him again the moment of complete despair had passed when she had received that assurance from his lips and as she thought of it sitting in the absolute stillness of her room the proportions of the storm grew less and possible dimensions of a future hope greater just as the seafarer when his ship lies in a flat calm of the oily harbour thinks half incredulously of the danger past despises himself for the anxiety he felt and vows that on the morrow he will face the waves again though the winds blow ever so fiercely in unorna the master passion was as strong as ever in a dim vision the wreck of her pride floated still in the stormy distance but she turned her eyes away for it was no longer a part of her the spectre of her humiliation rose up and tried to taunt her with her shame she almost smiled at the thought that she could still remember it he lived she lived and he should yet be hers as her physical weariness began to disappear in the absolute quiet and rest her determination revived her power was not all gone yet on the morrow she would see him again she might still fix her eyes on his and in an unguarded moment cast him into a deep sleep she remembered that look on his face in the old cemetery she had guessed rightly it had been for the faint memory of beatrice 
but she would bring it back again and it should be for her for he should never wake again had she not done as much with the ancient scholar who for long years had lain in her room in that mysterious state who obeyed when she commanded him to rise and walk to eat to speak why not the wanderer then to outward eyes he would be alive and awake calm natural happy and yet he would be sleeping in that condition at least she could command his actions his thoughts and his words how long could it be made to last she did not know nature might rebel in the end and throw off the yoke of the heavily imposed will an interval might follow full again of storm and passion and despair but it would pass and he would again fall under her influence she had read and keyork arabian had told her of the marvels done every day by physicians of common power in the great hospitals and universities of the empire and elsewhere throughout europe none of them appeared to be men of extraordinary natural gifts their powers were but weakness compared with hers even with miserable hysteric women they often had to try again and again before they could produce the hypnotic sleep for the first time when they had got as far as that indeed they could bring their learning their science and their experience to bear and they could make foolish experiments familiar to unorna from her childhood as the sights and sounds of her daily life few if any of them had even the power necessary to hypnotize an ordinary strong man in health she on the contrary had never failed in that and at the first trial except with keyork arabian a man of whom she said in her heart half in jest and half superstitiously that he was not a man at all but a devil or a monster of over whom earthly influences had no control all her energy returned the color came back to her face her eyes sparkled her strong white hands contracted and opened and closed again as though she would grasp something the room too had become warmer and she had forgotten to lay aside her furs she longed for more air and rising walked across the room it occurred to her that the great corridor would be deserted and as quiet as her own apartment and she went out and began to pace the stone flags her head high looking straight before her she wished that she had him there now and she was angry at the thought that she had not seen earlier how easy it could all be done however strong he might be having twice been under her influence before he could not escape it again in those moments when they had stood together before the great dark buildings of the clementium it might all have been accomplished and now she must wait until the morning but her mind was determined it mattered not how it mattered not in what state he should be hers no one would know what she had done it was nothing to her that he would be wholly unconscious of his past life had she not already made him forget the most important part of it he would still be himself and yet he would love her and speak lovingly to her and act as she would have him act everything could be done and she would risk nothing for she would marry him and make him her lawful husband and they would spend their lives together in peace in the house wherein she had so abased herself before him foolishly believing that as a mere woman she could win him she paced the corridor passing and repassing beneath the light of the single lamp that hung in the middle walking quickly with a sensation of pleasure in the movement and in the cold draught that fanned her cheek then she heard footsteps distinct from the echo of her own and she stood still two women were coming towards her through the gloom she waited near her own door supposing that they would pass her 
as they came near she saw that the one was a nun habited in the plain grey robe and black and white headdress of the order the other was a lady dressed like herself in black the light burned so badly that as the two stopped and stood for a moment conversing together unorna could not clearly distinguish their faces then the lady entered one of the rooms the third or fourth from unorna's and the nun remained standing outside apparently hesitating whether to turn to the right or to the left or asking herself in which direction her occupations called her unorna made a movement and at the sound of her foot the nun came towards her sister paul unorna exclaimed recognizing her as her face came under the glare of the lamp and holding out her hands unorna cried the nun with an intonation of surprise and pleasure i did not know that you were here what brings you back to us a caprice sister paul nothing but a caprice i shall perhaps be gone to-morrow i am sorry answered the sister one night is but a short retreat from the world she shook her head rather sadly much may happen in a night replied unorna with a smile you used to tell me that the soul knew nothing of time have you changed your mind come into my room and let us talk i have not forgotten your hours you can have nothing to do for the moment unless it is supper time we have just finished said sister paul entering readily enough the other lady who is staying here insisted upon supping in the guest's refectory out of curiosity perhaps poor thing and i met her on the stairs as she was coming up are she and i the only ones here unorna asked carelessly yes there is no one else and she only came this morning you see it is still the carnival season in the world it is in lent that the great ladies come to us and then we have often not a room free the nun smiled sadly shaking her head again in a way that seemed habitual with her after all she added as unorna said nothing it is better that they should come then rather than not at all though i often think it would be better still if they spent carnival in the convent and lent in the world the world you speak of would be a gloomy place if you had the ordering of it sister paul observed unorna with a little laugh ah oh, well i dare say it would seem so to you i know little enough of the world as you understand it save for what our guests tell me and indeed i am glad that i do not know more you know almost as much as i do the sister looked long and earnestly into unorna's face as though searching for something she was a thin pale woman over forty years of age not a wrinkle marked her waxen skin and her hair was entirely concealed under the smooth headdress but her age was in her eyes what is your life unorna she asked suddenly we hear strange tales of it sometimes though we know also that you do great works of charity but we hear strange tales and strange words do you unorna suppressed a smile of scorn what do people say of me i never ask strange things strange things repeated the nun with a shake of the head what are they tell me one of them as an instance i should fear to offend you indeed i am sure i should though we were good friends once and still are the more reason why you should tell me what is said of course i am alone in the world and people will always tell vile tales of women who have no one to protect them no no sister paul hastened to assure her as a woman no word has reached us that touches your fair name on the contrary i have heard worldly women say much more that is good of you in that respect than they will say of each other but there are other things unorna other things which fill me with fear for you 
they call you by a name which makes me shudder when i hear it a name repeated unorna in surprise and with considerable curiosity a name a word what you will no i cannot tell you and besides it must be untrue unorna was silent for a moment and then understood she laughed aloud with perfect unconcern i know she cried how foolish of me they call me the witch of course sister paul's face grew very grim and she immediately crossed herself devoutly looking askant at unorna as she did so but unorna only laughed again perhaps it is very foolish said the nun but i cannot bear to hear such a thing said of you it is not said in earnest do you know why they call me the witch it is very simple it is because i can make people sleep people who are suffering or mad or in great sorrow and then they rest that is all my magic you can put people to sleep anybody sister paul opened her faded eyes very wide but that is not natural she added in a perplexed tone and what is not natural cannot be right and is all right that is natural asked unorna thoughtfully it is not natural repeated the other how do you do it do you use strange words and herbs and incantations unorna laughed again but the nun seemed shocked by her levity and she forced herself to be grave no indeed she answered i look into their eyes and tell them to sleep and they do poor sister paul you are behind the age in the dear old convent here the thing is done in half of the great hospitals of europe every day and men and women are cured in that way of diseases that paralyze them in body as well as in mind men study to learn how it is done it is as common to-day as a means of healing as the medicines you know by name and taste it's called hypnotism again the sister crossed herself i have heard the word i think she said as though she thought there might be something diabolical in it and do you heal the sick in this way by means of this thing sometimes unorna answered there is an old man for instance whom i have kept alive for many years by making him sleep a great deal unorna smiled a little but you have no words with it nothing nothing it is my will that is all but if it is of good and not of the evil one there should be a prayer with it could you not say a prayer with it unorna i dare say i could replied the other trying not to laugh but that would be doing two things at once my will would be weakened it cannot be of good said the nun it is not natural and it is not true that the prayer can distract the will from the performance of a good deed she shook her head more energetically than usual and is it not good either that you should be called a witch you who have lived here among us it is not my fault exclaimed unorna somewhat annoyed by her persistence and besides sister paul even if the devil is in it it would be all right all the same the nun held up her hands in holy horror and her jaw dropped my child my child how can you say such things to me it is very true unorna answered quietly smiling at her amazement if people who are ill are made well is it not real good even if the evil one does it it is not good to make him do good if one can even against his will no no cried sister paul in great distress do not talk like that let us not talk of it at all whatever it is it is bad and i do not understand it and i am sure that none of us here could no matter how well you explain it but if you do it unorna my dear child then say a prayer each time against temptation and the devil's works 
with that the good nun crossed herself a third time and unconsciously from force of habit began to tell her beads with one hand mechanically smoothing her broad starched collar with the other unorna was silent for a few minutes plucking at the sable lining of the cloak which lay beside her upon the sofa where she had dropped it let us talk of other things she said at last talk of the other lady who is here who is she what brings her here into retreat at this time of year poor thing yes she is very unhappy answered sister paul it is a sad story so far as i have heard it her father is just dead and she is alone in the world the abbess received a letter yesterday from the cardinal archbishop requesting that we would receive her and this morning she came his eminence knew her father it appears she is only to be here for a short time i believe until her relations come to take her home to her own country her father was taken ill in a country place near the city which he had hired for the shooting season and the poor girl was left all alone out there the cardinal thought that she would be safer and perhaps less unhappy with us while she is waiting of course said unorna with a faint interest how old is she poor child she is not a child she must be five-and-twenty years old though perhaps her sorrow makes her look older than she is and what is her name beatrice i cannot remember the name of the family unorna started End of chapter eighteen